in order uh, to uh, get things started now, uh, I have a, a piece of paper in front of me that uh, I believe is uh, uh, from a book of, uh, written by Professor Habermas. And, uh, and the little title there says, The Known Historical Facts. And these are supposed to be you know, facts that we can uh, hook into as some area of agreement. Because if we don't have an area of agreement, then it's hard to have any discussion. People will just be talking past each other. So I'm going to go through these, and then I'll first uh, uh, throw the door open to Professor Flew and to uh, ask for his reactions. And with any luck at all, a discussion will ensue. Um, number one, Jesus died by crucifixion. And two, was buried. Three, Jesus' death caused the disciples to despair and lose hope, believing that his life was ended. Four, although not as widely accepted, many scholars hold that the tomb in which Jesus was buried was discovered to be empty just a few days later. Five, the disciples had experienced which they believed were the literal appearances of the risen Jesus. And six, the disciples were transformed from doubters who were afraid to identify themselves with, with Jesus to bold proclaimers of his death and resurrection. Seven, this message was the center of preaching in the early church. And eight, was especially proclaimed in Jerusalem where Jesus died and was buried shortly before. As a result of this preaching, nine, the church was born and grew. Ten, was Sunday as the primary day of Worship, 11, James, who had been a skeptic, was converted to the faith when he also, also believed that he saw the resurrected Jesus. And 12, a few years later, Paul was converted by an experience which he likewise believed to be an appearance of the risen Jesus. So perhaps now, Professor Flew, you could say what well, areas you agree or disagree. In crucified, so. yes, of course. Abundant evidence for that. Dead, I think so, but... Wait a moment, uh, because uh, uh, Pilate, uh, who undoubtedly had experience of crucifixions, was surprised that Jesus uh, uh, was, you know, finally dead at that time, and then he was taken down. Uh, now, in view of other things that have become known now, uh, there are possibilities of some sort of revival. Now, the next thing, surely, do we have evidence of the actual burial? Yes, we have evidence that Joseph of Arimathea was proposing to bury Jesus, and we also have evidence of the um, uh, tomb being empty. But what I think we don't have evidence of it is of its being occupied. And a rather different line I want to take at some later stage. Uh, granted that um, uh, uh, he rose from the dead and uh, uh, was moving around, uh, what is the uh, next stage? Uh, presumably, he's not buried again. He is presumably goes up to heaven. Now, what is involved in this? Uh, is the body supposed to rise up and somehow disappear? I, I don't think we have any information about what is even expected to have happened there. To complete a resurrection, surely, we've got to have a death and presumably an actual burial and then another stage about which uh, nothing clear seems to have been said. Okay. Would you would you like to react to the I would worries love to react. <laughs> <laughs> um, in probably two minutes or less, no. Um, okay, notice he said Jesus was crucified, and you said, I think he, he died, but something like that. I think, but not positive, or the think, but let's just look at this, or something like that. Well, that uh, Pilate thought he was right. dead, but very early, you know. Uh, and Pilate uh, was surprised at a report of death. And he, after all, had in that rebellious Jewish part of the empire 
uh, experience of crucifying other people. That, that was in Mark 15. Uh, let me ask yeah. you a question. So, so you like Mark, mm -hmm. right? Mark's a good source, okay. Um, all right, let me make a few comments about crucifixion. We know a lot about crucifixion today and what happens on the cross because, well, for a couple of reasons. Uh, unfortunately, some people, have, some people have been crucified in recent history, but a number of medical doctors have actually asked for, I want to say victims, but more like volunteers, to be crucified. I know one of those medical doctors who asked for volunteers to come in and, and get up on a cross. And what they find out is this. You don't, you don't fake, and I know you're not saying Jesus fake necessarily, but you don't get down off the cross alive. And here's what happens. When you're hanging, and it doesn't have to be nails, it doesn't even have to be a cross, it could be the monkey bars if you're hanging long enough. But here's what happens. When you're hanging in this position with your arms above your head, the weight of your body pulls down on the muscles surrounding your lungs, the intercostal pectoral deltoid muscles, the same muscles you work out when you're you know, doing weights or something and they constrict your lungs when the weight of your body pulls down on them. And the way you relieve that, when you're in the low position on the cross, when you're in low position where your knees are bent and you're slumped down, you begin asphyxiating. And you die fairly quickly if you don't do something about it. An experiment in Cologne, Germany, done by a medical doctor some years ago, the males who volunteered all they did was tie these guys to two by fours. That's all they did. And they lost consciousness at a maximum of 12 minutes. 12 minutes, so you can't hang on the monkey bars that long, but theoretically, um, they lost consciousness 12 minutes. So what you do on the cross, the, the guys in the experiment, their feet were hanging. If your feet are tied or nailed, you push up. And you push up into a position where you relieve those muscles around your lungs. But you can't stand there very long because especially if you're on nails, but when you're pushing up, you're going against gravity and you're pulling, and it, it is difficult to keep doing this. You can basically stay alive as long as you can keep pushing up and down. When you can't push anymore, you slump down to the low position and it's over relatively quickly. So for a centurion not to be sure that Jesus died on the cross, he would have to be so unaware of crucifixions is to think that when a man is standing up and heaving, that he's dead. If you're down in the low position for, let's say, 15 minutes, let's say 30 minutes for sure, they're pretty much sure he's dead. Now, I, I invite you to check this out. There have been articles published, dozens of articles published in medical journals, one about 15 years ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association. In fact, in that article, three scholars, including a pathologist from Mayo Clinic, wrote Jesus' death certificate. And they said he died due to, to asphyxiation complicated by shock and uh, congestive heart failure. That's one. Secondly, it was common, and we have a bunch of references to this in, the, in ancient history, to people doing a, a death blow, so to speak, a coup de grace, to somebody on the cross. We have a case where a person was threatened with a bow and arrow. We have a case where a guy had a skull cracked open before he, he died. And we learn in the same gospel, Mark, and the other gospels, we learn, actually, let me back up. This one's not a mark. But they, they would break ankles. And you can figure out now why they do that. If you break ankles, the person can't push back up again, and they asphyxiate. They did not break Jesus' ankles, we're told. We're told they stabbed him in the chest. We have two other cases outside the New Testament where people were stabbed. And uh, we're told blood and water came out. The major medical explanation is that around the heart, there's a sac, it's called the pericardium, and it holds a thin watery fluid. Um, and so they believe these medical doctors, many others, this is almost unanimous among the medical doctors who study this, they believe he was stabbed in the chest, in the, in the, well, they were stabbed in the chest, but they believe he was stabbed in the heart, because that's how you get the water out of the sac around the heart. <clears throat> and so in that article, they concluded he was dead when the spear entered his body, but if he was not, the spear wound would have killed him. Now, I'll shorten the last point, but I'll make a real quick point here. These are not the main reason why scholars don't accept this wound theory today. Almost nobody believes this. In fact, John Dominic Crossan, no friend to uh, evangelical Christianity, the founder, co-founder of the Jesus Seminar, John Dominic Crossan said, the fact that Jesus died by crucifixion is as sure as any fact could be in the ancient world. Now, why would he say that? 
you, you've got the asphyxiation, you've got the heart wound. But thirdly, David Strauss, 150 years ago, said the problem with, with uh, the swoon theory is that there's a logical problem. And that is, nobody who was weak and sickly and had thought he was dead, but he came forward later, you know, we talked about this, he, if he showed himself to the disciples, the problem is they would think he was alive, but they would never think he was risen. Not if he's sweating and bent over and the wounds opened again. He hasn't even washed his hair. Uh, if he's dripping blood, there's a path behind him of blood. They would never think he was raised. They would only think he was alive. And here's the problem, Strauss said. Strauss, by the way, was, was probably the most liberal of the 19th century German liberals. That was their formal name, German liberalism. Strauss said, the disciples would get a doctor before they proclaimed him risen. Because he would convince them he was alive, but if there's no risen Jesus, there's nothing the church can get excited about. There's nothing for the church teachings to be based on. If he's, raised, if he's alive, that's great. But if he's not raised, if they didn't believe he was raised, there'd be no basis for a church. I mean, you can could, you could imagine Peter over in the corner when Jesus struggles into the room, Peter coming over in the corner saying, oh boy, someday I'm going to have a resurrection body just like his. Because over, over 20 times in the New Testament, for, for good or for ill, we're told that believers would be raised like Jesus. The point is they couldn't believe that if, if, he hadn't, if, if they thought he was alive but not raised. So anyway, there's, sorry I took so long on the explanation, but there's just a few thoughts for you. I don't know if you want me to talk about the burial too, but go ahead, you, well, can, uh, you respond. I, I don't know the extent to which your reservations about the resurrection hang on your reservations about the actual death, but if you, um, if you want to say more about you that. You gave then yourself you know, way out there. You said uh, <laughs> you think he died. So. Yeah, so. Well, uh, yes. Uh, okay, yes, I think this does carry it. I still am puzzled about uh, what evidence there is that there was actual burial, because as you know, that I believe the resurrection appearances were uh, grief-related, um, I don't know whether you yeah. call them visions or just experiences, um, uh, the existence of which um, there is apparently immensely strong evidence, and they are apparently fairly common, though I had never heard of them at all in uh, my uh, in, in life of injury. No friend of ours and no, uh, uh, had ever had one of these grief-related experiences, but apparently they are common. So that's the line I'm inclined to take. And these experiences would clearly uh, be experience of the dead person as they were when they were alive. So they uh, uh, wouldn't be ex experiences uh, of uh, a broken person at all. So that's the uh, line I would. But I still like to know about the whether there was an actual burial or evidence for an actual burial. What do you think about the questions about his death? Are you satisfied on? Do you think that that's... Yes, I, I, sh I should have thought so, yes. Okay, good. That um, uh, this, uh, in view of your evidence about the effects of crucifixion, um, it su would suggest that this is a, a much quicker death than people have thought that it was. Well, people could be on the cross for days, and that's probably why Pilate asked that question. They could be on the cross for days. It depends on how long you can keep pushing up and down. But don't forget, he was beaten three times. Yeah. And uh, so I think some extraordinary things were done in his case. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that probably shortened. And he was on the cross, after all, for six hours mm -hmm. by the timing. Yeah. So, well, you want me to talk about the, yeah, the burial? OK. Um, first of all, I would say this right off the bat. Whether he was buried or not buried, that's not that doesn't play a role in crucifixion. To, I mean, I'm sorry, that doesn't play, play a role in resurrection discussions to me. Um, if a person's dead, you could have no idea where they were, but if they're dead and you see them again, now that's an issue. But, but let's talk about the burial for a few moments. Here's some, of, here's some of the data we have for the burial. It's reported in all four Gospels, so you have multiple attestation because if you're used to New Testament, the way New Testament critics speak, the four Gospels are not 
one source, they're not four sources, there's different ways of figuring this out and that's a long theory. But you have multiple attestation because everything we have says he was buried in a tomb. Nothing contrary, nothing to the contrary. Uh, thirdly, you have, uh, you have leaders who were at the cross who wanted him to die. You had Romans, you had some of the Jewish leaders that you mentioned. And it would be incredible to me if they thought, they just let him go and said, oh, we don't care about the body. You know, I think they want to see this thing through to completion. And further, we have a report that's recorded in Matthew. It's recorded in two early writers, Justin Martyr, Tertullian. Both tell us that, that uh, Jewish observers admitted the tomb was empty. Now, that'd be a pretty incredible admission if there was no burial in a tomb. So there's, there's four considerations. Another one is uh, most scholars believe that behind the Gospel of Mark, there's a, what's called a pre-Markan passion narrative. This, Mark is already early, about 35 years after the cross. They think the source is, obviously, if it's a source, it's even earlier. And this source gives you the data. So, I mean, that's five. Here's a, here's a quick sixth one. I can give you others if you want. But I think maybe the best witness to burial is the fact that all four Gospels don't just report it but they report that besides the men you mentioned, Joseph and Nicodemus, um, the women were present, and they were the first ones there on Sunday morning. The reason this is so significant is not to offend any of the ladies here tonight, but in a Mediterranean world, especially in Jewish Mediterranean world, in general, there's exceptions, but in general, women were not allowed to testify in a court of law. Now, sometimes they were very kind to the women. Sometimes, for example, one, one ancient reference says, um, don't ask women, all they do is lie. But another reference, another reference says, women's testimony is more trustworthy than men. So you do get some mixed comments. But my point is, if you're making up an account, and you don't think people are going to accept the testimony that all the earliest witnesses were women, if you're making it up, you don't make them your chief witnesses, because people don't accept the story in the first place. So that's, I don't know what number, that's seventh. Uh, we could do some others, but I think, I think that's probably the reason why virtually nobody uh, has any, you know, if he's dead, he's got to be buried somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. so. What do you think? Yes, yes. Yes, um, okay. He does have to be buried somewhere, but not necessarily in the official tomb. But all those, all those reasons are reasons for burial in, this, in the tomb. But yeah. like I said, I mean, ultimately, I think that's, you know, for the ancient world, seven, eight reasons, that, that's a lot of reasons. But, yeah. but uh, ultimately, somebody, it's possible to not, this is not my view, but I mean, somebody could say, well, I don't know what happened to the burial. The issue is dead and alive, not dead, buried and alive. It's just dead and alive. If you're dead, you ought not be alive. So um, that's the issue. Let me write that down. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But of course, the, the Jewish opposition um, uh, was, uh, was much concerned about uh, that uh, this death should be final. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm the, sure you're right. The whole point of the thing. Sure. And the more they wanted to be sure he was dead, that's more reason to believe he was both dead and buried, because they would want to see the process through, right? I mean, they would just yeah. walk away and leave him up there. They'd want to make sure they saw this thing to completion. That, by the way, is what we are told in the Gospel of Matthew. Yes. Their refusal uh, to believe after this, I suppose they, the refusal was uh, to believe in uh, uh, somehow a drastic continuation of the, of the, the supposedly resurrected life, wasn't it? Uh, they wanted this to be a final end sure. uh, to this distressing opposition to the um, official line. You know, you mentioned the book of Acts this afternoon in yeah. your lecture, being a you know, pretty good source. There's an enigmatic reference. It's a half a verse long. It's, a, it's an Acts 6. We're not given any reasons, but it says something like, the, one, one of the points up there is that the church was founded and Christianity spread, obviously. And it says in, in Acts 6, it said, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. No reasons are given. That's just a really interesting little tiny half verse there about yeah. people whose job it was to make sure that this thing wasn't, as you say, you know, it was, yes. that it was a good yeah. job. 
What was going on in Jerusalem was a, a very puzzling thing, wasn't it? The, um, uh, both the, the opposition and the support were, I mean, there was a, a very big conflict between the official view of the, I suppose, the Pharisee party and um, the Christians. Yes, by the way, I think the fact that it happened in Jerusalem is one more reason for the, one of the additional ones we could give for the burial. If I, if I proclaimed that there's a local holy man and he died and he's been buried in, in your town here and, and I say, hey, funny thing, it's three days later, the grave is empty, go see for yourself. If I said this happened in Monterey, I imagine most of you won't go. If I said it happened in Rome, I imagine most of you won't go. If I said this happened in Tokyo, I imagine most of you won't go. But if I said it's at the end of your street or it's five blocks away, I imagine some people are going to check this thing out. So Jerusalem is the last place the empty tomb should have been proclaimed unless it was empty. Right? Because any number of people could have taken a Sunday afternoon stroll and gotten there easily enough. And so that, that's the last place to proclaim the message. The fact that it was proclaimed in the city is one more reason to think, you know, there are checks and balances in this town. People can yeah. tell if their proclamation is true. Yeah. And nobody disputes the fact that the earliest preaching was in Jerusalem. No. Yes, this is, a, this is a, the whole uh, event in Jerusalem. It is uh, the crucial place, isn't it? Right. Coming up from the, the backwoods to Jerusalem, the uh, crucial challenge to the traditional authority. I mean, going into the temple, of course, is uh, to provoke the traditional authority, isn't it? Even, I, even Rome, even a thorn in Rome's side, because you read Suetonius or others, and Rome had emperor worship. Yeah. And you remember Pilate's questions, you know? Yeah. Uh, are you the, you know, you claiming to be the, uh, you want to know who he thought he was. And it, I don't think Jesus was any kind of a threat. You were talking about how peaceable he was this afternoon. Mm -hmm. I don't think he was any kind of a threat to Roman re regime, but they may have thought that with, uh, with large crowds yeah. and Passover time. Uh, and almost have, certainly, because uh, uh, the Jewish people were a, a major threat to the, Roman imperial regime, really. They were, uh, and they were much more numerous, actually, uh, than is generally believed because of the very large number of um, uh, Jews who'd moved into other parts of the empire outside the area of roughly the modern Israel. They were a large exceptionally educated, and in a way, from the point of view of the emperor, exceptionally troublesome group. Well, of course, at Passover time, they come back to Jerusalem, yeah. so this is already a rough time of the year for the Roman soldiers. And the Romans had had uh, one or two, and were going to have another major conflict with the Jews as a rebellious group. 66 AD. Quite, yes. Well, it, you, you have some qualms, but it, it sounds to me, like, yeah. you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me you're virtually conceding that perhaps uh, you can accept these as oh, yeah, uh, yeah. relatively uncontroversial. So uh, m my best guess is you think there's a, a, a better explanation for these, if they are facts, than the actual resurrection. Yeah. So I'm wondering um, if you could say something well, about that. Well, I, I, surely... Um, the actual belief in the resurrection is more than the belief uh, that uh, Jesus uh, was, you know, resurrected. It's uh, uh, what's supposed to have happened later, his acquiring a status of somehow more than a, a chap who has been so fortunate as to be resurrected, of whom there are uh, so other biblical examples, aren't they? I mean, Lazarus, for instance, is supposed to have been really after a longer period of death, actually. 
and there are at least two in, well, one in one kings and one in two kings, and I believe there may be some other oddments elsewhere in the Bible, but there, there are all these, and clearly uh, this isn't from the point of view of the establishment of the essentials of the Christian religion, anything like the whole story about the resurrection. I mean, of course, the nature of the being uh, resurrected uh, makes this more exciting than any of the others because of, uh, uh, to put it mildly, the charismatic character of Jesus. After my recent comparisons with the uh, uh, prophet of Islam, I mean, uh, the resurrection of Jesus in view of his life and sayings and so on is clearly going to be of more world historical interest than the resurrection of Lazarus. And it's the something more that I am altogether unclear about. Especially if, as Christians believe, Lazarus had to die again and Jesus didn't. Right. So obviously yes. that makes yeah. all the difference in yes. the world. Yes, it clearly does, yes. Especially given right. Jesus' claims. Exactly so, yes. Because for claims, I mean, just humanly speaking, if he made extraordinary claims, which anybody can do, mm. but if he made extraordinary claims, and they are extraordinary, I mean, I don't think there's a parallel in the history of religions, mm -hmm. but he makes extraordinary claims, and if he's raised from the dead, well, I mean, dead people don't do much, so if, if, if he's dead, he's not going to be acting upon himself. Quiet. And so if he's made extraordinary claims, and if, and if, as he claimed, he's acted upon by another to be raised, now people are asking, and I think justly, whoa, who, who's this guy supposed to be? Mm -hmm. You know, because in the, in the New Testament, the resurrection is the evidence of the claims, hence its, its centrality, one of the Quiet. facts we put up there. So, obviously you don't believe in the resurrection. What do you think is a better explanation of the data? Well, I'm wanting to know what is the, the something more other than the character of Jesus himself, which makes this of, uh, uh, of special significance. I mean, surely he's supposed to um, uh, go to another place, isn't he? I think the best evidence we have for resurrection is the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. and, and no matter how skeptical you get, I mean, people like uh, Michael Martin and G.A. Wells mm -hmm. uh, concede that Paul was an eyewitness to what he believed was the resurrection appearance of Jesus. One of the yeah. facts that there. James, the brother of Jesus, same thing, who was an unbeliever during Jesus' life. That's conceded by virtually everybody. Um, these two men, James, the brother of Jesus, and, and Paul, are unbelievers until they think they meet the risen Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul's testimony we have firsthand, and that's what makes him such a powerful witness. Yeah, yeah. Because Paul says a couple of times in 1 Corinthians 15, I mean, I'm not even aware of a well-known New Testament scholar who denies the Pauline authorship mm -hmm. of 1 Corinthians. And he says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord? Then in chapter 15, he gives data that he received from somebody else. He said, I gave unto you what I also received. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and appeared. And he lists appearances to individuals and groups. And last of all, he says, last of all, he appeared to me. And then he says three verses later, he says, whether it's I or the other apostles, this is what we preach. So Paul, not only is given his own experience, he's our best window we have on the other apostles and what they were preaching. Galatians 1 and 2, another undoubtedly Pauline mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. G.A. Wells grants it, so that tells you something. Um, in Galatians 1 and 2, twice, and maybe three times, Paul makes trips up to Jerusalem. He met with the three best-known Christians at that time. He met with Peter, John, and James, the brother of Jesus, who was a Christian before Paul. And he met with all three of them, and he said he checked out his gospel message of the death and resurrection of Jesus, and they agreed with him. So, I mean, I mean today, we would call Paul, I mean this respectfully, but we would call Paul obsessive because he goes up to Jerusalem once, and that's just like, like getting on a plane and making an hour plane flight, you know, that's a pretty good trip. 
He goes up there once, he goes up there a second time in Galatians 2, and he may go up a third time, depending on what we think Acts 15 is. So he makes two or three trips to Jerusalem to talk to the main disciples to ascertain this message, and he said they're preaching the same thing I am. So what you get here, you don't get a resurrection, but what you get is people who are totally convinced they saw the risen Jesus. And now what you have to ask is, how can we explain that data better? But they are um, repeating, aren't they, substantially the things uh, uh, said earlier on by Jesus? Or are they uttering a new message? I'm, I'm not sure what you're well, asking. Um, uh, well, roughly, they are repeating his claims, aren't they? They're not... Uh, they're, they're repeating their beliefs that they saw him. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so we have their testimony from a very early date. In fact, most critical scholars think we can date Paul's reception of this testimony mm -hmm. to 35 AD, which is only five years after the cross. Not the books themselves, but his trip to Jerusalem where he got this testimony. To, you, you can even work it out. If you put the cross at 30, mm -hmm. Paul's conversion is usually put at one or two years later, just say, just say two, that's 32. He tells us in Galatians 1 that three years later he went up to Jerusalem to talk to these guys. So 2 plus 3, 5, 35 mm -hmm. AD. So Paul gives us the year markers right there in his works. And he tells us he went up there just, at, and I mean, I think of a, a German historian like Hans von Kampenhausen who says these texts in Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, Galatians 1 and 2, he says they give us all the checks and balances that you would want from an ancient historical text. I mean, when you talk about ancient history, Oh, yeah. You know, you're talking about usually repetition of things that are a century or two centuries oh, before. Oh, yes. And you get something from five years before, I mean, afterwards. And then, of course, Paul says, I gave you what I was given. So mm -hmm. he was told this by the other disciples. They knew it before him. So there's no gap at all. You know, if he got this five years later, he's kind of a Johnny come lately. He's a, you know, as he said, I was born out of due time, um, which is the word, by the way, in the Greek, 1 Corinthians 15, it's, it's the word for. Uh, uh, an abortion or for a, an aborted birth. He said that was him. And these guys were Christians before him, so there's virtually, there's no gap there at all. He got it five years later. They had it before he did. Yeah. Um, uh, he has a similar vision. Uh, but surely there's supposed to be something extra, isn't there, about uh, 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 Jesus' future. We have, if we like, a, a resurrected Jesus for whom people are having visions and so on. Uh, and uh, it's supposed to have a wide, and he's supposed to be going somewhere, isn't he? What, what troubles you about that? Well, uh, um, he's uh, not going to be a continual. Um, resident of the planet Earth, no. is he? Why um, would that be an issue? What? If he was raised, he can kind of do anything he wants, can he? <laughs> why, well, would, why would going back to heaven in whatever form he went, why would that be an issue for somebody who was raised? I mean, I would think the, the much bigger miracle would be the resurrection, right? If, if he, let's put it this way. If he is who he claimed to be, and then he was raised like and if he, if, he claimed, if he was who he said he was and, and he was raised to show it, I wouldn't stand in his way wherever he wanted to walk. <laughs> uh, no, you know. but um, what he's claiming to be is the Son of God. Right. right. Now that seems to be a rather odd claim. I mean, not obvious to me how this uh, claim of a special relationship to the uh, 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 ruler of the universe and he claimed it was a unique relationship, too. He said he was the only one who had this. Well, yes, I can see why that should be claimed to be unique. Uh, but <laughs> it's not clear to me what, it is, what it's supposed to involve, uh, really. I mean, uh, uh, we have a development of a doctrine of the Trinity, which uh, is um, a difficult one, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, what would you do with the person who claimed to be the son of God, 
who claimed to have a unique relationship to the God of the universe. He made some other yeah. pretty interesting claims too. He, he claims to forgive sin, and when the yeah. leaders say, hey, you can't do that, that's blasphemy, and he says, well, to show you I can do it, I'll, I'll heal this man. Uh, he claims to be the son of man, which contrary to popular opinion is not a human claim. There, there's first century Jewish literature that we have that son of man literature is a very lofty claim. In fact, that it probably eventually got him killed. But so he makes these claims about himself. He claims that only I have this in with the God of the universe. And they say, well, how do we know this? And he says, well, because I'm going to rise from the dead. And he does it. Do you listen to him at that point? Do you think, uh-oh, this is getting too close for comfort? Um, well, it certainly gets too close for comfort, yes. It's um, uh, remaining a very perplexing claim, I think. Uh, a very... But the resurrection sort of puts his money where his mouth is, you know what I mean? Oh, yes. It's yes. one thing to make a claim. Yeah, oh, yes. And then to be raised on top of it is rather special. First of all, we don't, yeah. even have a, we don't even have claims like that from the founders of the major world religions. So not, even the claim no. is rather extraordinary. That's to make it true. Oh, it just makes it very extraordinary. Yeah. And then we don't have a claim that any other religious founder was raised, even by his orthodox followers, even if he let them talk about it. So it just seems all around that this is exactly... I mean, certainly if you let Christians well, tell the story, it's a very Islam, extraordinary. We don't have claims to any miracles at all. And the point that uh, Aquinas was uh, right. eager to make in You're the right. Summa Contra Gentiles was precisely that there are no miracles even claimed. Of other founders. About the founders. That's correct. Or I think any others are there. The well, at least the major founders. Yeah, Ed, Edwin Yamauchi, professor of ancient history, University of Miami of Ohio, said no other founder of a world religion, for no other re founder of a world religion are miracles even claimed in the primary documents of a generation or so yeah. later. We have no other example of that. I think that's right, yes. And again, but they're, they're claims, and, and, and then he puts everything on the resurrection. He says that's, that's the big one, and then here he is. That's why Christians are excited about this. Yes, yes. <laughs> hey, it, Professor Flues, you're, uh, you, you seem to have shifted a, a, a bit here. Is your, is yeah. your issue that uh, the resurrection never took place or the, the resurrection uh, leads one to make fantastic claims about what it means to be the son of God, or is it those sorts of claims, or is it the resurrection per se that you think there's a better explanation for it as a, you know, hallucination or something like this? Um, I am um, intensely puzzled by the whole situation here of uh, what on earth is going on, even if you uh, uh, grant the resurrection has occurred, uh, this seems to me uh, an event so extraordinary, I uh, uh, don't know what's to be said about it at all. And I don't uh, believe in the um, objectivity of the appearances. You know, I, I can see that um, uh, uh, we have a, a claim that um, um, uh, the body was resurrected, but the claim to the resurrection seems to me based on the appearances. That's fair. And I, I don't think those appearances are an adequate basis of it. Um, <clears throat> in all this, I think one ought to, to notice that uh, uh, um, any um, experiences of claims to what is nowadays called the paranormal, what used to be investigated by what was called psychical research. Any claims to the genuineness of such occurrences have to be founded, if they're to be believed, on a really extraordinary amount of evidence. 
Uh, indeed, anything that is conceived to be miraculous does need to be it, because one must approach any question about an alleged miracle uh, with a pretty uh, stubborn presumption that it didn't really happen. Because its extraordinariness depends on its being a unique event. Um, so what would you, you know, okay, so we have this data, we have these facts. If, it, if we need extraordinary data, yeah. what could we put in the place of resurrection? Uh, well, in the place of resurrection, uh, but it, it's the um, uh, continuous activity of Christ as is uh, supposedly supported by the appearances. But if he's appearing, if he is genuinely appearing after being genuinely dead. But uh, that's what I don't think was the case. We have a whole lot of people who think they saw him. But then this is what happens with What's the a, what is a better What is a better explanation of the historical data we have? That they were grief-related appearances. That, uh, now you don't mean real appearances. Well, you mean grief. Oh, yeah, well, okay. Um, ostensible appearances, yes. Uh, what uh, seemed to them what the old time philosophers would call sense data. Okay, so you're basically, if you're going to say grief visions, you're saying hallucinations. If you like, yes. Yes, because the other way it sounds like yes, you almost sorry, in the resurrection. Yeah. I know yeah, that's not sorry, what you're saying. I should have said. Uh, <laughs> to you as a, it would be a, a short a discussion if it were, wouldn't it? Yeah, well. Right here on your <laughs> campus, Tony Flew <laughs> just <laughs> likes the resurrection. No, that's not... Uh, okay. Uh, could this have been grief-related hallucinations? That's what he means when he yeah. says grief visions. We, we've done this a few times. We've been on some other... We spent a whole discussion on this, a whole three hours on this a few years ago, on the grief visions. But I'll tell you real briefly, the issue with most people on any kind of hallucination, whether it's grief-related hallucination or any other hallucination, there's probably no theory that is fraught with more difficulties than this one. But here's, here's a few of them real quickly. People don't see hallucinations in groups. Uh, an hallucination is no more objective than a dream. An hallucination, by definition, is when you believe something so strongly, you make the mental image. Well, obviously, I don't see your mental image the mental image you create. Um, and so, uh, by the way, we should understand how radical hallucinations are too. If, if you're driving down the road and it looks, you look like you're seeing water across the road in the summertime, or you come home at night and it's cold and you take a coat off and put it up on one, the post of your bed and put your hat on top of it and wake up in the middle of the night and think somebody's standing in your room, those aren't hallucinations uh, because you're seeing data and misinterpreting them. So, so those, those are different. Uh, but hallucination, as you said, is something for which there's no objective referent. Mm -hmm. It's standing and talking to my deceased grandmother, who I just know all of you see right here, mm -hmm. where there's no other data. So it's a pretty radical claim, and it's a private claim. So anytime you have groups of people who believe they saw the risen Jesus, if they, if they believe they saw him in groups, you have to have each individual having an individual hallucination, which is highly problematic. For example, in, in Paul, you and I have discussed before Paul's list in 1 Corinthians 15, which there, I don't think there's a critic around who's going to deny the earliness in Paul's listing these appearances. And he, several of them are individuals, Peter, James, Paul, but he also lists three groups. He said Jesus appeared to 12. He appeared to all the apostles at once. He appeared to 500 brethren at one time. Well, group appearances are very, very difficult for hallucinations because you don't hallucinate in groups. Uh, another issue is the different personalities involved. You've got men, women, indoors, outdoors, walking, standing, sitting. You know, you don't manufacture hallucinations every time you change. When you change scenarios, that, that mili uh, militates against hallucination. That's a, there's a second issue. Uh, another one is that they weren't in the right frame of mind. I mean, in the Gospels, one of the facts up there is that they were disillusioned, they were in a state of despair. A hallucination generally comes from a state of, a, a heightened state, not a, a down state. Another problem is the empty tomb. If Jesus had, if there were hallucinations, there would have been a body in the tomb. 
And like I said, this is Jerusalem, so you could have strolled down to the tomb on an afternoon and saw that the tomb was empty. But of course, it's, if it's hallucinations, the body's still there. One more thing, we could go on, but, but uh, hallucinations generally don't change lives. I know a couple guys who've, who've researched Navy SEALs who they have, they, are, they put themselves in situations where they frequently see hallucinations. You get hallucinations from bodily deprivation when you're denied food and water for weeks. And, and these guys, they're, they're supposed to work together in groups. And there's some research done on this. And they are talked out of these things by their friends. <clears throat> and when you ask them later, well, why don't you see the octopus waving to you and smiling, which is one, one, one Navy SEAL said. Another one picked up an oar and he was swinging it over the top of the boat. He said, what are you doing? He said, porpoises are jumping over the ship. One of them jumped off of the ship into the water, and the, one of the uh, captain said, what are you doing down there in the water? And the guy said, a train's coming right for us. Now, these obviously aren't objective. When later, when they were interviewed, and they'd say, well, how come porpoises weren't jumping over your ship? Or how come there wasn't a train out there? How come there wasn't an octopus smiling and waving? They said two things. Those things don't happen, and my buddies didn't see it. Now, if you apply those same two things to the resurrection appearances, my buddies didn't see it, if they're individual hallucinations. And secondly, these things don't happen. Dead men don't rise, to quote David Hume. So they're convinced against themselves. Anyway, there's a bunch of other problems. J James and Paul are two huge issues because they were unbelievers. So why would they manufacture hallucinations? That's just... A string. Can, can, can I just a, a, a ask a question? Is, is, is the issue then we're car comparing improbabilities to be imp wildly improbable to have a group hallucination of this sort? But I wonder what the improbability of that compared to the improbability of someone being dead, right. raised again, right. and then actually being the Son of God and those. It, it seems to me that the intrinsic improbability is greater on the latter than the former, isn't it? You know, you know who you're quoting here? That guy right there. <laughs> his, his encyclopedia. I told you he was an eminent philosopher. Yes, he was. <laughs> yes, he is. He, write, he wrote the uh, article on miracles for the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and he raised that same issue. And, and it's, a, it's a great question. But to me, the problem is this. All right, let, let's, let's take a look at that one. Okay, what's more unlikely, a group hallucination or a resurrection? And you said you would think on the surface that a resurrection would be stranger than a group hallucination, even though we don't know any group hallucinations in history either. But still, a resurrection would be stranger. The problem is, it's not a one-time exception. If what the New Testament records is true, there are appearances to Peter, to James, who's an unbeliever, to Paul, who's an unbeliever, to 500 at once, to the apostles, to the disciples, to the women. So you have multiple, multitudes of groups. Now I would ask you, what's more likely? A number of group hallucinations or a resurrection? What I mean is it's not just one appearance. You start mounting up the issues again. I agree with you. It is a probabilities issue. Right. Well, but, you know, I, I don't know that you, you have to be committed to, there, there could be deceptions. Some people say they have an appearance and they don't. And the, and, the vision of the 500, that does seem to me, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, we really don't have evidence of that that would satisfy anyone uh, if it wasn't accompanied by things that they were more inclined to believe, like the um, uh, ones to Paul and so on. I mean, uh, that claim tossed out as, oh yes, and there were uh, an appearance to 500. That's always seemed to me a very odd and arbitrary and implausible addition. The, the reason the it's taken thing. seriously is that it's in Paul's list in 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah. And that list, as I said, he said he received it from somebody else, and critics think it can be dated to 35 AD in Jerusalem. So this list is taken very seriously because, by the way, there are non-Pauline words. It's a, it's a memorized list that's codified. You can tell by the script, the way they lead into it. There are dozens of these things in the New Testament. They are, they are texts that were oral testimony, oral preaching, before the earliest books were written. Paul says he received this. And again, most critics put this in Jerusalem, 35 AD. The reason they take it so seriously is because the appearance of the 500 is in the list that he gives in 1 Corinthians 15. That's why the appearance of the, 50, the 500 is taken so seriously, because it comes from this earliest strand of, of evidence. I'm afraid that uh, uh, this 
uh, I mean, uh, this thing tends to discredit anything it's associated with, it seems to me. But why, why would it be an issue? I mean, if earlier, if Jesus preached to larger groups than that, you know, yeah. we have the famous, the feeding of the 5,000 incident. Yeah. There's another group of 4,000. If there were thousands of people there on occasion, why is it I priori odd that 500 people uh, well, would be together? Uh, I mean, I'm afraid the feeding of the 5,000 is uh, one of the uh, uh, statements that I find great difficulty in believing. But what I'm saying is, as far as a group of people coming together, just the fact that you could, 500 is you know, nothing to have together, say, Passover season, you've got many times that. But you've got a group of 500. But the issue is not how many people... But a people... group of 500 having a vision uh, is uh, much more remarkable than a group of 500 or 501 or 499 Eat, come together. It seems to me it is utterly disproportionate to all the other claims and would require very much stronger evidence. What do you think about appearing the... to 12 people at once or appearing to the apostles? Do you like that better? Um, See, if you, if you appeared to anybody, you still have a resurrection, so... Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you have a resurrection, uh, but the thing that still remains is the... Uh, uh, this is extraordinary enough, but getting to more on the basis of these uh, um, uh, clearly miraculous occurrences. Can, can I ask you this yeah. question? Are you, are you don't like the appearances? What would count the, you know, the if, for a resurrection? Could anything count? Or is it in principle that is just so wildly implausible? I don't care what, you know, I don't know if you have a videotape or something. What, mm. what, what would count? Perhaps video would. I don't know. Well, yes. <laughs> that would help. <laughs> I just happen to have one here. <laughs> they'll, just, they'll, be, they'll be on sale in the back of the room. <laughs> Yes. I like a cut of that. A special bargain offer. A special yes. bargain just tonight. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, that's a great question. What would count as good yes, evidence? Yes. I'm not sure I can answer that one at all. No. Well, let, me put a, let me put an additional little barb in it. Theology and falsification. Mm -hmm. Yes. An article that you wrote in 1955? Uh, <laughs> uh, it, was, it, was, it was published in 1955, I think, yes. Well, it was good. It was, it was good. But, but you said it counts against a view when it's unfalsifiable. In fact, you Absolutely. used it today yeah. of the yes. Muslim view. Yeah. Yes. Is, is your view unfalsifiable? My unbelief, you mean. Against the resurrection. Yes. If you have this list of facts, and every time we bring something up, it seems to be opposed by a, a number of rejoinders that say, boy, cut me off of that one. Oh, yeah, okay. And you start answering your questions. At what point do you say, looks like a resurrection? Or at what point would you say your view is, is or is not falsifiable? I think the only honest answer is I can't think at the moment. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, you know, Tony Flew is responding to Tony Flew here. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I think the unfalsifiability of unbelief is, a, a, mm. a, is somehow a different problem from the um, unfalsifiability of a belief. But if you, can't, if you can't falsify, if there's no probable rejoinder to resurrection and you're left with, well, I don't want to believe it anyway. Now, of course, that's your right. Yeah. But it, it's your belief that's unfalsifiable then, right? Um, Yes, though one could, I suppose, always imagine things that uh, would be just uh, overwhelming confirmation. Would a resurrection falsify your belief? <laughs> um, could this be it? Could this be the data that would 
I mean, in principle, it would be, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, I, I suppose I have uh, an almost invincible disinclination to believe the, uh, the whole resurrection story, yes, uh, because it seems to me so wildly inconsistent with everything else that happens in the universe. Maybe the universe is different too. I mean, that's another issue, but yes. maybe this is one of those singularities, you might say, that might make you question a lot of other stuff, if it were true. Oh, yeah, I think the answer to that must be certainly yes. Yes. Uh, that it is uh, just so extraordinary if actually the whole thing happens, you know, straightforwardly. They are creatures of flesh and blood that the um, uh, apostles see and so on. It would and be rather wonderful, Thomas wouldn't it? Thomas <laughs> could put his uh, thumb or was it his finger in and all that. Sure. Uh, the, the whole total story is so wildly unlike the things that happen in Los Angeles even. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you know, we, we talked else. earlier today, we had a lecture in here on, yeah. on near-death experiences. Yes. I mean, a near-death experience is not a resurrection, to be sure, no. but the highly evidenced ones, you see what I'm saying? Uh, a highly evidenced near-death experience where somebody reports data with a flat EEG for mm. three hours, and they report things that they saw during these three hours when the brain wasn't working, I mean, that's not a resurrection. But what I mean is it, it, it raises the bar a little bit. It says to you, yeah. wow, this world might be a little different than um, what we think it uh, is. This is uh, going to be looked at, um, uh, has been looked at by people studying it as, extra, as the putative phenomenon of extrasensory perception. Um, and, of course, there are complications in the... Um, the, 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 the theory of this, that there's also uh, uh, something retroactive, uh, extrasensory perception. But even if it is, mm -hmm. even if it is, you have something rather, I mean, what if we gave a de definition of life after death, of something like extrasensory perception after death? What I mean is, yeah. This extrasensory perception puts it off a little bit, but if you have people reporting things when their brain isn't functioning and they seem to be alive and well, yeah. and we have dozens of these cases, the highly evidenced kinds, I'm just saying... But they're extrasensorily perceiving um, uh, things that were uh, going on uh, when they were brain dead, isn't that it? Brain dead. Yes. Right. I, I'm not trying to get us off the subject. I'm just no, saying. No, no. I'm saying there I could be things. About to intervene, so. it, I was just going to say there could be things in this world that show the world is not quite. The oh, same. very that's much. That's all I was so. saying. Yeah. Yeah. Could, could I, I ask a question sure. about that? Because uh, that sort of thing would would say to me that if the world by by which you mean the world, the laws of nature may may be different from what we understand them to be, perhaps. Or there may be adjustments to them. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, but do, do you really want to say that uh, the Christian confidence in the resurrection of Christ is a part of the natural order of things that we just haven't discovered yet? Or do you want to say it's a supernatural intervention? Sure, you, now, I, go ahead, you can get that a couple ways. Of course, Jesus claimed, all right, he says he's special things about himself. He says he'll be raised from the dead to show who he was. He says, I'm the only one in the universe who knows the God of the universe, and the resurrection will show that this is me. He's raised from the dead. Okay, now when you put that together, I, th I think that's where you get the supernatural conclusion. Because his claim is that the God of the universe is acting upon him. And, and whatever else you do with it, I mean, that is a supernatural claim. Now, on the, on the uh, other point of the natural claim, if somebody said to me, well, what if we find an, uh, an explanation in the future? What if 100 years from now we find something that makes sense? And I would just say the same thing we do of all scientific Theses, I would say, well, then let's face it in 100 years, or let people face it in 100 years. But as far as we're concerned, we need to decide on the data we have. We can only do what we have with right now, and I think that's something, you know, we would agree to. But you can only, you can only make a decision now based on what you have now, not invest in a... I mean, that's just two ways to look at it. But, but the other way was Jesus made these special claims, and it seems that by the... Res, by the re, he claimed that the resurrection showed that the God of the universe was acting upon him. Mm -hmm. 
So I would say supernatural to answer your question. Well, it, it just occurs to me that if, if it were more like the extrasensory thing, you know, that surely someone could have the ability and be mistaken even about what the nature of that ability was. So what, what, it, does, it just doesn't seem to me if it were just a, you know, someone, some, I, I once uh, heard a lecture where someone claimed that uh, Jesus' death was not real on the cross, but was a, a technique that he learned studying yoga, right? And I, I took yoga for a year, and I didn't get that surviving the crucifixion <laughs> lesson, but um, let, let me give you I, I think I missed that day. Yes. But, uh, yes. but, but I, I'm wondering what, what, what would warrant the inference, just because he makes a claim, and, 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 and you're making the case that there's strong historical evidence that the appearance is he makes his claims, and, and, he, but, and, right. and he makes an additional claim that involves a claim that there's a God, and I'm the the, the Son of God, and, and the, the, this uniqueness. But I, I'm just having a hard time making that compatible with the view that maybe the world is different than what we know, because the world being different would make it a part of natural phenomena that we just don't know yet. And it seems to me that the Christian view would would be something that. You know, what would it be to have a whole bunch of natural evidence that somehow adds up to supernatural? Except the resurrection itself would be pretty tough to explain in a natural order. I mean, David Hume in section one says it would be a resurrection if a man would be raised from the dead. So it would seem, of course, he didn't admit that, but, yeah. but it would, there are some things on the surface. You're, we're not adding a bunch of non-supernaturals to get a supernatural. The resurrection itself would seem to be a very supernatural claim, at least according to a lot of people. As far as, I know you're teasing about the yoga thing, but the thing with people who are, who are practicing yoga or practicing anything, if they are held underwater for 10 minutes, they're dead whether they're practicing yoga or not. Yeah. And a person who's on the cross, if what I said earlier is true, and you're slumped in the lower position, you're dying whether you're, you know, the guys- I, I have no doubts about that. Oh, I, I know you don't. But I mean, I, I say to people sometimes, uh, if, if, I, if I hang on the cross and I say, I hope I'll, by the way, I know a guy who got up on this thing, a guy with a, a medical doctor, who got up on one of these deals and was cru crucified himself. He said within two minutes there was excruciating pain in his chest. But if a person is going to be in the low position on the cross for, let's say, 10 minutes, no discipline is going to keep them from breathing. So you've got, that's, that was the, that's the built-in checks and balances. And I know you're not questioning that. I'm just when you mentioned the yoga thing, I just throw that out there, you know, that, that, yeah. there, that there are built-in checks and balances on the cross that guarantee this, so. So uh, an awkward pause hovers over <laughs> our panel. <laughs> I think it's your business to say something else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you? <laughs> well, I, uh, Professor Flew, uh, so uh, according to your position then, then the, the best explanation for the that data, if you're willing to accept it, is some kind of illusion. So what, what is your response to the unlikelihood of, you know, a collective? Well, I know I'm, you're not a collectivist, but this would be no, a collectivist. Uh, uh, a different kind of collectivist. <laughs> no, I'm afraid back to the situation of the almost invincible unbelief. I just, uh, 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 this is so unlike anything in the rest of my experience of the world that I just don't know how to um, uh, cope with this at all. And is, is, un, is invincible unbelief unfalsifiable? Um, uh, uh, well, His I view would be, if it's unfalsifiable, it's meaningless. That's, I th no, that's no, no, I don't think this would be so. No, uh, I suppose uh, I can imagine a series of developments which would make it clear to me that the universe wasn't at all as I had previously thought it to be. Uh, but of course, I don't think anyone believes that this is going to happen. They believe that this is uh, uh, a unique, central thing. Uh, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, the most important fact in human history. Isn't that a, a position that any Christian believer would have to say about these facts or alleged facts? Could, could I ask you this? They just don't have any analogy 
in any experience of anything else. This was essentially a once for all um, uh, divine intervention in the affairs of the universe. Isn't that roughly the, the, what the claim is? It'd be a pretty major one. Yeah. So it, it's your view that those who believe now in the resurrection, at least their beliefs are not warranted, they're not justified. Oh, no, I don't think I'd want to say that, because, um, uh, no, I, I think uh, to say this with absolute confidence, they're not just that, because uh, one of the points I think particularly wanting to make on this occasion is that um, uh, reasonable people uh, may make disastrous mistakes on what the basis of what they themselves had good reason to believe. So, um, uh, so this is a disastrous mistake, but a rational. Well, uh, no, uh, but uh, um, yes, the uh, belief. Uh, no, uh, I don't want to say it's irrational for other people to believe in in this. It seems to me it may be perfectly rational for them to believe in this, but I can't cope with this idea at all. It seems to me so unlike anything else that happens in the universe. And the way I would normally approach this is by taking a, a favorite example of mine, the commander of a, a unit of tanks who, because the available intelligence that he had, and he had every reason to expect that the i in his uh, army had got it right, it usually did, but in fact uh, leads his unit into a trap in which massacres a lot of them. As you cannot say that he was an irrational man being in that position. And I think this idea can be extended to uh, uh, many other things. to some of the uh, most recent arguments for the existence of God. I think uh, the, um, uh, uh, what they call it, the, um, uh, the, the, the view about um, the um, uh, physical design. constant. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, that um, uh, the people who already believe in God, I think they are quite rational in thinking that this is a confirmation and ditto uh, with the Big Bang theory. But I don't think, and it, this I think will become clearly uh, uh, with the fine-tuning argument, thanks for the reminder, uh, with the case of that, because uh, if the main purpose of the God uh, in creating the whole universe was to have human beings, as uh, would appear from the book of Genesis, uh, in which uh, the God is not apparently a sustaining but only an initiating cause, and therefore his creatures are reasonably free human beings. Um, <laughs> if his purpose of that, he would surely have created the universe as all the scientists of the Middle Ages believed he had as the center of the universe, you know, uh, as the view that was overthrown by the scientific work of Copernicus. But the idea that the uh, creator of the universe would plan the universe so the eventual of, uh, emergence of Earth and human beings was the product of an extraordinarily unlikely coincidence of the physical constants, all of which he presumably formed as the creator of the universe. It seems to me it's uh, positively preposterous to think of this as a positive reason for unbelievers to believe that God created the universe. But I think it's uh, reasonable enough for the people who believe that already to say, gosh, this is confirmation. You show that he planned it all in this extremely subtle way and he made all the physical constants combined in this way so that it would happen like that. Like, it, it would be wonderful, wouldn't it? <laughs> it, it would have been wonderful. That's the point. I, I, I think this is an important thing to see that in these matters, um, 
uh, people can fundamentally disagree, though they are equally rational people. They are doing what it is entirely reasonable for them to think on the basis of what they already believe. Let me ask you a question about your tank illustration. A person who makes a rational but very wrong decision. Mm. The problem with that, it seems to me, if that, if that was a parable yeah. of Christianity, for example, the problem with it is the knife cuts both ways, right? I mean, yeah. atheism could be the tank commander, too. Oh, yes. Right? Certainly. Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, leave uh, the whole I'm thing. I'm not saying this is something <laughs> it's all fair. that is reasonable <laughs> it's all uh, fair for and Christians, love and war. <laughs> but not for other people. No, I think this applies to all of us. Uh, and so we're right back to, we have to decide on the data in front of us. Yes. Uh, and um, in the light of our own, uh, as we think, most reasonable beliefs before we came to this problem. So, so if one already believes in a transcendent God, then the issue of the resurrection uh, I think this but would, this would be a case, gonna, I've only you know, thought about it in, in the case of, uh, you know, the latest arguments for the right. existence of God, which were introduced before I first started thinking about this subject. <laughs> um, I was an adolescent before the Big Bang Theory was formulated. <laughs> How old can you get? <laughs> I'm looking at a cheat sheet, and uh, the cheat sheet says that it's almost time, though not quite, but uh, it's about time for um, uh, closing statements from the speakers, after which uh, we can have a period of uh, questions and, with any luck, answers. <laughs> so uh, since we started with uh, Oh, I guess, would you like to make a closing no, statement? No, I... You're I, done. I, <laughs> yes. That was it. <laughs> yes. Okay. That was the thing I particularly wanted okay, to well, say. Very yes. good. So, uh, that was the apex of that's your right. case. Where do you right. go from there, right? So uh, per perhaps Home, you would like to I make that. Uh, sure. Answer. So when I leave tonight, when I think about this, I will remember the tank commander. That's <laughs> Well, l let me, let me uh, tell you a little bit about my methodology, which I haven't said yet, I'll say this is sort of tying up everything I've done. The method I use in speaking about the resurrection is this. I don't think a, a Christian or a non-Christian has to assume that the Bible's inspired or not inspired, trustworthy or not trustworthy. I would rather work from a lowest common den denominator position and work up. We started tonight with these with these facts, and I think that's a way to, and we pretty much agreed on these. We did this, did this one other time, and we had total agreement. Um, we pretty much share those, and I'll tell you what, they're pretty much shared by the whole critical community, Christian and non-Christian alike. Now, if that's a, a basis, you don't, have to, you don't have to say, well, yeah, but it's in the Bible, I don't accept the Bible, that misses the point. The point is, are these, are these historical facts, and are they known on their own grounds, no matter what the source? Do we have good sources for them? I, I will just throw this out there. We have a dozen and a half sources outside the New Testament for Jesus. Contrary to popular belief, he's one of the most mentioned people in ancient history. In fact, yeah. the earliest comment about Jesus could well be from a Greek historian, predating the New Testament. And what he records, by the way, is a miracle. So it's not just New Testament data. But I'm, I'm, I'm not proposing tonight using the New Testament as someone saying, well, that's your book or that's inspired, or you think it's reliable. I'm saying if we don't start with any of those, and all we know about the New Testament is that it's a book of ancient literature. And it was Dr. Flew who said today that in his, in his lecture this afternoon that the New Testament comes with very good credentials. But I don't have to even make that assumption. If I just have some data, like what's up here in the board, I think we have to make assumptions, and what comes from those assumptions will have to be linked to the, to the data. Now, I was pleased to hear him say that Christians are rational. And, and believing from their structure, uh, believing in the resurrection. But I think you can get there this way. The single fact that's most important in that list is that the disciples believed they saw the risen Jesus. They thought they saw the risen Jesus. Without that, you don't even have a church. So people say, well, of course they thought that. 
They thought they saw the risen Jesus. Now here's, you have to take that and all these accompanying reasons. They're transformed lives, they're willing to die for it. What do you do with James? What do you do with Paul? They run believers. They too believe Jesus appeared to them. But you have this belief that they thought Jesus appeared to them. And you ask, can I explain this with other hypotheses given of what I know of science or history or philosophy or anything? And if the data looks like Jesus appeared, then I think we have a problem if we're just going to reject it. Or if we say, well, you know, my belief structure doesn't work there. Um, you still have to deal with the data. Now, I will say, too, um, I have not been a believer in these things all my life. I spent 10 years uh, searching, and uh, I actually rejected the resurrection, and I used to argue with Christians and tell them they were full of it and everything else, and ended up doing my doctoral dissertation on this subject and being convinced it happened. <clears throat> But then also, in 1995, I had a chance to, to test this, and uh, uh, my, wife, my wife passed away with, with stomach cancer. And from, actually, Tony knew her because he came once to our home and stayed with us at the school for a couple weeks, and, and she passed away just a little bit after that. And uh, then, of course, you have all these issues about evil and pain and evil, like you folks who were here last night heard. And so it, I, all I can say is that in, in 1995, when this happened, in 1995, I had a grad student who called me on the phone and he asked me, he said, where would you be today if it weren't for the resurrection of Jesus? And I admitted, I mean, I realized that if, if Jesus was raised from the dead, it makes all the difference in the world. To have somebody who, who, for whom the evidence says it looks like they were raised, and then the New Testament saying over and over again, Christians could be raised like him. That's a pretty significant event. And then when I'm sitting there looking death in the face and losing my wife, I'll just end with the last verses of 1 Corinthians 15, the same passage we've been talking about. Uh, Paul basically trash talks death. At the end of 1 Corinthians 15, he says, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? He's basically saying, you've got nothing. You've got nothing, because he goes on to say, the answer is the resurrection of Jesus. And that's how he ends. And of course, for him, coming from his background, basically a, a scholar, uh, Tony called him very, you know, a, a very worthy philosopher today. And we have him converting, too, by what he thinks is the resurrection of Jesus today. So I'll just end with that thought. I, I, I think, for me at least, within my noetic structure, uh, it, if, if this is something that happened in 30 AD, then it's something that has continuing meaning. And uh, for my family and I, that's all we had in, in 1995. But I think if you have the resurrection, you have plenty. So that concludes the uh, official part of the uh, conversation, and uh, now it's uh, your turn, if you like, to uh, come to a microphone and ask a brief uh, question. And uh, so if you want to come up, make sure that it's a question that you have and not a speech, and the question is brief. Are they going to address it to one of them? And you address it specifically to one or uh, another. And I see we have someone here, so oh. go right ahead. Actually, I was hoping to hear from both of you, and I had two really quick ones. One is, what do both of you have to say about the speculation that um, the followers of Jesus moved the body and hid it in order to sort of keep the movement going? And the other is, does Jesus' divinity depend on the resurrection? If you have no resurrection, do you have no divinity? Are, are they dependent? And that was my question. Okay, a couple questions, a couple responses. Um, the first question, what about the disciples doing something to make a claim? The, the theory that the disciples may have stolen the body to perpetrate their claim is a theory which in the history of responses to the resurrection has basically not been held by virtually any major critical scholar since uh, Herman Reimarus, a German rationalist, did it in the 1760s. There's a reason. If, if, if critics are not holding this theory and have it, there's a reason they have it. And there's a lot of responses to this, but, but the long and the short of it is this. When somebody dies for something, no matter what it is, it could be an atheist dying for communism. It could be a cultist believing a UFO, UFO or, I, or I don't even know if cult is I don't even know what, word, you know what words describe all this, but people have a lot of beliefs that other people think are, are cultic, and you might think what I hold is. But if I, 
if somebody is willing to die for their faith, you don't say, oh, they perpetrated a fraud. Let's say they went ahead and died. You don't say they perpetrated a fraud. You'd say, wow, that was a very brave person who must have really believed what they said. Now, Tony will quickly point out, believing something doesn't make it true, and that's correct. But, if, but here's the, the point. If the disciples died for what they believed, and we have ample evidence of that, we can talk about it if you want, from early history. But the disciples died for what they believed, then they at least believed it. So to say they stole the body and then really believed it seems to be a huge problem. Plus you've got James and Paul who are, how, how do you get James and Paul involved in this plot? So there's a lot of other issues. Um, deity. The question was, could you have deity without a resurrection? Is that right? Yes, if that's what he's claiming. I mean, if, if his claim is, I'm deity, take it or leave it, or I'm deity and I'll heal this person's leg or something, you'll have to take that on its own grounds and see. But, but my, so yes, I mean, that, that could work. But what I'm saying is the evidential value would be a lot lower, and that's not what Jesus claimed. Jesus said, uh, I'm deity and I'll show it by being raised from the dead. So now he's making the ultimate claim, and it's a you know, stand or fall kind of view. I think that's where Paul says, uh, if Christ had been raised, our faith, you know, we have our faith, otherwise our faith is in vain. I think that's the kind of the point there. Did, did you want to respond? Because she addressed the question to uh, both of you. Did oh. you have anything that you wanted to No, I didn't. No, I think okay. this is... Uh, I hope the uh, question is not too disappointed. But you no, can. I think uh, what um, you've said is perfectly satisfying. Well, thank you. Yes. So ditto thank from uh, you. Professor Flutter. Ditto. So, <laughs> go ahead, sir. Uh, this one is for... Uh, Dr. Habermas, is that, am I pronouncing it right? Um, you were saying that Paul received an outside source uh, as one of your discussion topics. Uh, it, was this one of the sources you were talking about outside of the Bible, possibly, oh. that was verified? He doesn't say, but, but yeah, that, he says that himself. Those are Paul's words. Paul uh -huh. said, I gave you what I was given. He said, I delivered unto you that which I also received. How Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, rose again the third day, and appeared. And then that list of appearances comes. That, that group of verses right there is not Pauline. It's, it's a piece of material that he took from somebody else and put into his book. Of course, he tells you that. I gave you what I was given. And so the, by far the most typical, critical position is he received that material while he was in Jerusalem at what we might say plus five, five years after the cross. Do we so have any that's, information? That's his testimony. I'm Do we sorry. have any information about that source that he received the information? Oh, well, from? there are sources outside the New Testament that say Jesus was raised from the dead or that the disciples believed he was raised from the dead. But actually, if you talk to a critic, like, say, Michael Martin or G.A. Wells, if you talk to people who, who are way over on the left by their own admittance, um, they're going to tell you, strangely enough, this will surprise a lot of people. I, my students don't get this for a long time. They will tell you the best evidence for the new the best evidence for the resurrection is in the New Testament. There are extra biblical material, but they have to deal with the data that Paul claims he got five years later, and they will tell you that Paul is an eyewitness. Michael Martin says that Paul is an eyewitness to what he's. So that's what you have to deal with. The best material is there, although we do have sources outside the New Testament. Um, as okay, I guess that's all my time. Okay. I think the questioner, please intervene. So go ahead. All right. Um, I'm just kind of looking for a little clarification as as far as like evidence goes. Um, what, as far as ancient. Who are you text, directing this question? Oh, I'm please. sorry. Um, Doctor Flu. Sure. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Pick one. Somebody, right, right. Yeah. Um, I'm just I'm just looking for what what constitutes um, something some form of ancient text to be considered um, evidence because. I mean, it seems like Dr. Habermas has, uh, has presented some outside sources as, as being considered outside text from the New Testament. Um, and specifically, um, speaking about the resurrection, I would think that uh, an appearance would be made to somebody that was not a follow uh, currently a follower of Jesus at the time. Um, and I, I would think that um, Saul of Tarsus would be considered one of those people. Um, that that appearance would be made to and such a radical change um, from his former lifestyle of persecution of the Jew, uh, Jesus followers um, would be some um, form of I don't know some form of evidence to me but uh, is there any outside sources of somebody 
uh, from some other people to back up the claim that um, that Saul was actually uh, not a follower of Jesus before, because I, I would think that that would be some. I would think that would be a claim from. It, 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 is your is your question about the historical nature about Saul of Tarsus, or is your question to Flu about what sort of historical evidence he might count? Uh, ba basically, I guess Paul. <laughs> I, I'll go. I'll go with Saul because uh, okay. I mean that's that's kind of kind of what I'm having a problem with is that it seems that Saul has presented his um, eyewitness account, and then that's not good enough, I guess, and. I mean, considering he wasn't a follower and then all of a sudden changed due to this appearance, I would, I would think that would hold some sway. I'm not clearly what you're saying, but I think the um, <laughs> worthwhile thing to say about this is the evidence of Paul is certainly important and strong precisely because he was a convert. Mm -hmm. He was not a prior believer. He was not an apostle. And the evidence that he hadn't been previously a believer is about as clear as it could have been because he had been an active opponent. I think this has to be accepted as one of the most powerful bits of evidence that there is, precisely because he was converted by his, his vision, the nature of which I think is... Uh, obscure, yeah. but still, yeah. he was effectively converted by this from being an active opponent of the whole Christian movement. He concedes it as evidence, it's just not convincing. It's just enough. not good enough, okay. It, it, it is striking though, isn't it, that the pe even someone like Saul is, while not a prior believer, is someone who believes oh, strongly in God. Yeah, right. Right. So uh, it goes to the other point about rationality. to bring oh. out that uh, uh, the evidence of Paul is the most powerful that thing, is, apart from right. the fact that he was an outstanding philosophical right. mind, as the major right. reformers were also. And of but, course but an appearance to Pontius Pilate would have been all. cool. <laughs> yeah, that would have been very nice. But. Yeah, it would be, but I, I wonder, I wonder what, would that do it? I mean, I remember back in my days when I was searching, I told you I was arguing with Christians and stuff, You'd say, well, if he appeared to Pilate, that would really be neat. Of course, he did appear to James, the brother of Jesus. You know, it's a family skeptic versus an outsider. That's two yeah, guys. Yeah. But I remember having a little episode where I looked out behind my house, and there was this large tree. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, if God really existed, he could knock that tree down. And I stood, and I stared at it, and I said, I thought so. And I turned, and I walked away. <laughs> Guess what? That night... There was a storm, and that tree was knocked down, and only that tree. Now, this isn't one of these barefoot through the snow on the way to school stories. I, I, I don't go that far back, but I'll tell you what. For a few years, I walked by that tree every day on my way to school, and it never, ever changed my skepticism. So I'm, I'm wondering, would that really have done it? Now, I think people, I think the would will... It, would have it done what? Convinced? No. Anthony flew? I don't know. Maybe I don't know not. if it would convince yeah. <laughs> Didn't happen to me. It's you who were convinced. Yeah, but what happened? Yes. <laughs> you, were, you were convinced by far less. No, I, I wasn't. What I mean is the tree meant nothing to me. At that night, it went down. No, I, I know. Thought, but but night, you were convinced thought, by the resurrection by less than an appearance to Pontius Pilate. The, the evidence that you have is you, enough. You know what I'd like to see? I'd like to see him see the risen, risen Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask that, actually. But yes. His own sense experience. Yes. And by the way, folks, if you guys, if you don't know this, he and I have been friends for almost 20 years. We've had a great few days here together, and everything I say teasingly, I say very respectfully to this man. He's a good friend, and I really appreciate him. I just want you to know that. And they hardly ever come but to blows. I don't think you ought to have been affected by this at all. It's not like that some of the, the stock cases, there's one on, in a small town near us where there's a monument uh, recording the case 
of someone who told a lie in the name of God and was struck dead immediately <laughs> afterwards. Now, that's the sort of persuasive case that didn't happen with you. It, God didn't say, uh, uh, you know, you didn't challenge God to do anything to the tree. You want to be real careful. And you then know. Uh, <laughs> you don't tell a lie. immediate <laughs> right. action, whereas this did happen in this right, small right, town. Right. I think there's a, the, the line for questions. I think uh, um, this, this is to Dr. Habermas. Us. Um, you say that we have to we have to pay attention to you know the evidence and there's a lot of historical evidence that Jesus did rise. My question is also there's a lot of evidence that this century there was a boy found in Tibet who was the 14th reincarnation of Buddha, and there's a lot of evidence for that. So how do we decide which factual evidence? I, to, I missed your point. A lot of evidence for what? That in Tibet there the there's the 14th reincarnation of the Dalai Lama, and there's a lot of evidence that he passed a lot of tests that he couldn't have passed if he had not been the 14th reincarnation of that, of the 13th uh, Dalai Lama. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of evidence that he is the 14th Dalai Lama who was reincarnated. So well, what would qualify as evidence for that? There's a story that the boy ran into a room and pointed in a chest of drawers and said, my teeth are in there. And the teeth of the 13th Dalai Lama, his false teeth were in there. They put him through a bunch of other rigorous tests that it, supposedly... It, they're codified tests for... For, for uh, proving that he is the 13th Dalai Lama. Exactly. So my question is, if that's also factual evidence, and that would prove a different parallel uh, religious universe, which, how do you discern which uh, historical evidence to take from? Good question. Um, so you're talking about something like reincarnation, right? Yes, I'm just, I'm just saying right. that we say we, you know, Paul, Paul says sure. this and there's a lot of evidence for that. There's also a lot of evidence for this, this case and so what, how do you discern which one is right? Let me, let me cite the leading reincarnation expert in the world. His name is Ian Stevenson. He's a medical doctor, a professor mm -hmm. at University of Virginia. Your professor here, I think, used to know him or studied there and, and knows of him. He's published several serious books on reincarnation. And after he looks at all the data, cases like that, people who say, go to this town and make this right-hand turn and make this one, you'll come to this little hut that's like this and like this. And he's got dozens of those stories. When he finished all his data and all his studies, Dr. Stevenson said, there's two theories that account for all the data. This is Dr. Stevenson. One is reincarnation, one is possession. He said, they both account for all the data. And he left it there. Now here's the leading reincarnation expert in the world who gives you a way out that he thinks is just as, that he thinks these two hypotheses can explain all the data. So if you're going to liken that, if that's going to be an analogy for the resurrection, you have to have, it would seem to me, you'd want to have an, an alternative that explains all the data just as well. So your view is the Dalai Lama is possessed? No. <laughs> I've, I've never met the man. Um, Thankfully, though, I can quote Ian Stevenson, and he's the one who says yeah. that data can be explained either way. And so I think, to me, that's not a close case if there's, a, if right. there's an equal hypothesis. Um, my question is for Dr. Flew. Um, I haven't read any of your books or anything, but um, I was wondering, you, you're here tonight um, kind of basing your argument against Jesus. Um, and I wasn't, just, I wasn't sure, because I was wondering what made you take the place, the argument against Jesus Christ or the God of Christianity instead of basing your philosophy against the Buddhist God or a Hindu God and your motivation for place, um, having your argument against the God of Christianity. Be, be, before he answers, I think he's an equal opportunity religious critic, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, but uh, I think her, her, she, was, she was wondering uh, why you directed uh, your, I mean, I mean, part of the answer is this is about the resurrection, so there's not much point in criticizing Buddhism for that, right? Well, but, I was uh, wondering. Uh, th uh, but she's wondering what, what, why your focus is, uh, in, in her view, anti-Christian rather than anti-Hindu Islam or something well, like that. But. It's because this was the subject announced for the evening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to stay on that subject, didn't we? Uh, uh, but uh, 
I will um, <coughs> indulge myself a little with a remark that I much the much respected supervisor of my graduate studies uh, once made to me. Uh, this was Gilbert Ryle, whose work on the concept of mind some of you may have heard of. And Gilbert once said cheerfully, some of my colleagues think I'm prejudiced, but in my opinion, there's nothing that rises in the east except the sun. <laughs> okay, thank you. I guess that's, that's it. <laughs> what did you say? I can't know much of the field. Go. <laughs> My question Go is for Dr. Flew. Yeah. Um, as an atheist, you believe that uh, human beings have no soul, there's no afterlife. When we die, we simply cease to exist, right? Uh, yes, if I'm asked that whether I believe in a future life, I do. Uh, but whenever I think of the uh, doctrine of hell and damnation, I'm a little uneasy. I don't regard the future life as I, I don't want a future life, thank you very much. Um, uh, and I don't even want a future life of eternal bliss as it's described in most heavens because it would, simply wouldn't appeal to me. But uh, uh, you are asking what I believe and I'm not being asked to give any reasons for my belief. But. Uh, the answer to the question, what I believe, is, is that, yes. Though my opinion about the ideas of the East is not necessarily the same as my supervisors. So you would rather take the chances that if, if you're right, that an, anyone who dies, what, no matter what they believe, there's no consequences, there's no gain, versus the fact that if Christians are right, that they when they die, they gain eternal bliss with God in heaven, and when you die, there is eternal damnation waiting for you. I, I believe he wants to give Pascal's wager. Pascal's wager. Yes. Oh yes, you want me to give Pascal's wager. Um, I'm afraid that this time in the evening I uh, don't feel fit. Uh, I have recently written some second thoughts about this, but I can't at the moment remember what they were. <laughs> at least he's honest. You're honest. <laughs> Is that, uh, that, that that's your answer? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, he, he I wants to know about, the, I, I, I take it that the question is, you know, all other things being equal, you know, if there's a better payoff for having uh, faith. Yeah, I mean, this is actually, some people may be interested, this is an argument derived from Islam. Um, I, uh, you know, it, it was something taken over by Pascal. I think it, it, it arrived in France via, um, I think, it, I'm not sure whether the dates were right for that, whether there were still Muslims in the south of Spain at that time. There were. There were. It, there were. it arrived like that. Um, uh, well, it's a, a powerful argument, I think. Uh, yes, uh, uh, but uh, the for it to be effective, the um, idea of the, a future life uh, uh, has to be granted at the beginning, doesn't it? Uh, because you are betting on uh, the alternative possibilities of a future life in internal torment, uh, which is given to you by the predestinating God of uh, traditional Christianity and Islam. Uh, not exactly what anyone will call a good God in any understand or normal understanding of goodness, but still. Um, uh, yes, uh, to, uh, for the uh, wager to be an effective challenge, the person who receives the wager has got to regard the hypothesis of a future life as a fairly live hypothesis, don't they? and then uh, their challenge to uh, take action to ensure uh, that the future life is satisfactory and not uh, 
the alternative. Basically. And uh, the idea of a future life is not one that should be uh, uh, taken as obviously a sound and coherent life, because human beings are creatures of flesh and blood. And uh, uh, what's supposed to be survived? It's supposed to be an immaterial spirit that is in control of the human being. Well, uh, this is not a basic accepted fact. Uh, this is uh, a notion uh, held by uh, uh, some people because they've been taught to believe it and uh, not by everyone. You know, it can't be just taken as a, an ob... We, we can't be taken to be obviously confronted with uh, two equally reasonable betting options. You know, Pascal has offered a wager as a, a betting option. I mean, he was, in fact, a, um, a, creator, a, a creator of some probability theory in his mathematician's life. Uh, well, uh, this isn't an option like making a bet on um, who's going to win a race when there's no doubt that there's going to be the race and there's no doubt as to who are the participants in the race. It's uh, uh, making a bet between uh, two alternatives, uh, both of which are based even for their intelligibility on um, a speculation. That's the best I can do for the moment. The, the, the issues, of, the pragmatic issues involving uh, pragmatic reasoning in Pascal's wager might, uh, might be another <laughs> topic for uh, another panel perhaps. Okay, it's, a, I, it's a good question. It's probably yeah. not entirely satisfactory to you. Okay. I just you, wanted, can, you can talk to him later about it. I just it. wanted to finish off by saying you said that uh, for, the, for the consequences there are human measures that must be taken by the believer themselves. All I, all I wanted to say was that all those measures are simply believing what you don't believe. So it's not like it's a lot of measures. Now, uh, we're having trouble hearing some of what you're saying up here, but anyway, please uh, make sure you're, as I said before, asking a question and uh, not giving a speech, and then we'll go over here. My question is for Dr. Flew, and if Jesus didn't resurrect from the dead, then what historically recorded evidence is there for the location of the body, or what happened to the body? She, she said, uh, if, if you don't believe in the resurrection, what happened to the body? Where, um, and what evidence do you have for another story? Is that fairly? I don't know. I don't pretend to know. I was uh, starting with a question. Um, does anyone know? Because uh, I don't think it's uh, that we can be in a position to know that the body was deposited <coughs> in a, a tomb. Though, of course, the uh, uh, the reasons of uh, uh, the, well, the, that opponents of, the, of Christianity wanted to, um, uh, well, wanted to find a body, didn't they? They wanted to find a body that hasn't, hadn't risen. I thought you said earlier, though, that we had enough basis that those seven, eight reasons I gave that were satisfactory for, for a burial. Yeah, I think uh, they probably were satisfactory. So she, so she wants to know what happened. If we do have a burial, then what happened yeah. to the body? Well, I suppose what happened to the body when it was buried. Yeah, well. But I mean, the tomb had to be op open within days <coughs> because it was right in the same city where people could have just taken a scroll, you know, and yeah. verified yeah. or falsified. Well, I presume what happened to the body if it was buried. I don't know whether there's a different Christian view. Perhaps there is, and perhaps the view is that the the body was resurrected. That's what Christians believe. I suppose yeah. so, yes. But she wants to know what you think. <laughs> like, I mean, I guess because what you're saying is you've been asking um, Dr. Habernas like all night to like show a historical evidence and like documented like evidence that the body did resurrect, and he's quoted the Bible and he's quoted other texts and stuff. So is there any text or any like person who's 
actually claim that the body is or was there after? Like maybe, the maybe I, say, I, I, don't, I don't think that he disputed that okay. historical evidence. I think his claim was that even if we agreed to this, that he didn't think it warranted the belief for him in, okay. the, re uh, in, in the resurrection. He doesn't claim to have evidence that shows that uh, you know the, the body was taken to Albuquerque or something. You know, he just says, "Well, look, yeah. you know, I, I know what you're saying. Maybe it's rational for you to believe it, but it doesn't add up for me." Okay. I Thanks. understand the view right. I like the Albuquerque. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, my question's for Dr. Habermas. Uh, I'm curious um, if Jesus claims to be the Son of God, and Christians accept that Jesus is the Son of God. Um, in fact, he's the second person of the Trinity, if I'm correct. Um, how miraculous is it really that he rose from the dead? I mean, I think what I'm asking is, as a Christian, should it be regarded as a miracle that the Son of God, or frankly, the second person of God, rose from the dead to begin with? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing your question. I, I didn't either. It's not, it, it's not your fault there's... Uh, an amplification. I heard son of God and I heard rise from the dead and I'm not sure. But you could make up an answer and like hope for a fit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're right. The, the, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> he was the son of God based on the resurrection. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's your point all along. That's my point. I think. <laughs> yeah. Can, can uh, you try again? Yeah, let me try again. Can you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> I think my question simply is, uh, for a triunal God in which Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, in fact is part of God, I guess is how you'd say it, how miraculous is it for a Christian for Jesus to rise from the dead since he is, after all, part of God? Like, shouldn't he be able to do that? So it's not a miracle, because what, what, what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> this is the Christian naturalistic theory for the resurrection. Yeah, that's right. Uh, no, I mean, but if you were a person, I think, I think this is the key. If you were in the countryside leaving your shop and going to hear Jesus speak on this, you know, sunny afternoon and you're, you're hearing him preach, and he's making these extraordinary claims, and these claims aren't computing. I mean, it's not every day that I bump into the Son of God, right? So if this guy claims to be the Son of God, this is rather extraordinary. When they're hearing his claims, they're not Christians. I mean, for the most part, I don't think these people are believing him. They're listening. And they're probably going back to their shop, scratching their heads, thinking this guy's really getting me thinking. Dr. Flew said today that he was a, that Jesus was an incredibly uh, charismatic figure, you know. And people say oh, this guy's fantastic. Over and over again, the Gospels say he sp he spoke as somebody who had wisdom, not as as one of the religious leaders they'd heard. So they were impressed with him. But nonetheless, I think they're going back to the shop, scratching their heads, saying, "I don't know what to make of this guy." But it seems to me that when somebody comes to the shop a few months later and says, hey, did you hear that? The, the Galilean is dead. He says, no way. Yeah, the Romans killed him. Oh, man, you know, what can I do with that? You go back to work in your shop. Somebody two weeks later says, hey, did you hear? The Galilean that you went to hear speak who was dead, he's been raised from the dead, and there's this, this big fisherman named Peter, and he's coming to town today, and I, I think we should go hear him speak. What I mean is this story was put together by bits and pieces. I think they were every bit as, as skeptical when they first heard it. But what closed the argument for them, those who believe, what closed the argument for them was the resurrection. Then it makes sense. I don't think it makes sense to them until they get all the puzzle pieces put together. And the resurrection is what took, put all the puzzle pieces together. I think that's the Christian position. I don't, I, that answers your question, I'm not sure. But. Anyway, I, I still like your view. <laughs> okay, my question is directed to uh, Gary Habermas. And, uh, my question is, you guys talked a little bit about uh, the idea of having tangible evidence of the resurrection, like the video camera. But uh, my question is, if God does exist, um, wouldn't he provide some kind of tangible evidence so we wouldn't have to have this argument in the first place? And then also, in addition to that, um, if I believe correctly, the I a major idea of Christianity is this idea of faith. And doesn't the idea of having to have the res resurrection occur sort of contradict that idea of having faith in God at the same time? Okay, now, you're, you're, I understand the faith part, but the first part of your question? The first part of my question was, if, uh, if God exists, wouldn't he provide some tangible evidence? Sure. I, I mean, he doesn't have to, but if God exists, I would think providing tangible evidence is one very important way he could act. And so when they see that in history, they think, 
wow, he's acted. I mean, that's precisely what they think. Now, as far as your faith, I figured when you go to universities or, I mean, any kind of forum, sooner or later, somebody asks that question. And I think it's a great question. But, but maybe I'm not reading your view correctly, but I'm hearing something like this. Isn't Christianity about faith? And you're sitting up here talking about evidence all night. How do you relate faith and evidence together? Is that sort of the... Well, I mean, I'm talking specifically about the resurrection, and you mentioned several times in your argument that a purpose of the resurrection was to show that Jesus was the Son of God. And right. you, you mentioned it just now for the little farmer <coughs> out you know, in the countryside. It was used as evidence right. that he existed. But doesn't that contradict the idea of having faith. faith in God? Yeah, no, to me. Okay, let me give you an example. You, you date somebody. And after a while, you think you know this person better than anybody else on the face of the earth. You're still not married unless you say, I do. You can, be, you can, you perhaps know them better than anybody on the face of the earth, but you still say, I do. I think that's a similar analogy to Christianity. When people come to Christ, they're saying, I do, to Jesus. I don't think there's any conflict between my knowing somebody and thinking, you know what? You're the kind of person I'd like to spend the rest of my life with, but realizing it takes a commitment. Now, don't I know that half the marriages in this country break up? Don't I know that this person might not be what they see? You know, there's all kinds of objections, but I say, no, I know you better than anybody else, and let's do it. That's my side. Would you, would you marry me, you know? Uh, I think it's very similar. Just because you have all your ducks in a row doesn't mean there's nothing disturbing these things. You can still have... Uh, issues, you know, and obviously the fact of what happens to marriages shows there's issues. So I think you try to be real careful, you try to line your data up, and you decide if, for your two cents, if you want to say I do. And that I do, that step, that faith, that commitment is not contradicted by the fact that you have all your ducks in a row. In fact, we say it's the opposite. We say it's a person who has everything lined up, who takes a step, who's smarter than the person who knows somebody for two weeks and does something. So. I, I don't think there's any conflict whatsoever between evidence and, and faith. Okay, thank you very much. I, I'm told that time is uh, running short, so five, five, two, one, one or two more questions, Michael says. And what he says goes, so you're good. Okay, the uh, disciples were all Jews with Jewish teaching, and isn't it Jewish belief that the Messiah would have been an earthly uh, Messiah, someone to set up a kind of a worldly kingdom? And it is to my knowledge that the idea of a resurrection was never taught in the Old Testament. Um, so what short of a resurrection would give the disciples the idea? And this kind of goes along with the hallucinization uh, theory. Who is your question uh, directed to? Sorry, towards Dr. Flew. I didn't even hear the answer to that. You know, the, see, the speakers are, uh, maybe you can hear it, but they're not pointed at us. We okay, how's that now? <laughs> okay, do you want me to repeat it? To us. Okay, the 12 disciples were all Jewish and uh, with Jewish teaching, obviously. Isn't it Jewish belief that the Messiah would be an earthly king? Um, and if it is to my knowledge that the idea of a resurrection was never taught in the Old Testament, so what short of the resurrection would give the disciples that idea? And this kind of coincides with the uh, hallucinization theory towards Dr. Flew. I, I heard about half of it. I'll, I'll take a shot at the half I heard, the part about the kingdom and the Jewish view. Um, I think you're right. The Jewish view is that a king is coming who sets a kingdom up, and he sets it up on behalf of the God of the universe. Interestingly enough, in, in Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14, this person is called one like a son of man. And the son of man is not what Christians call God the Father, because in the same context you have this person called the Ancient of Days. But the son of man is sent to, sent to earth to set up the kingdom. And very interestingly, that was Jesus' favorite self-designation. He called himself the Son of Man more than any other title. And I, this is a long, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here I'm not saying. But, but personally, I think Son of Man, who the Son of Man is, comes very close to who the Son of God is. I think there are two, two trips down the same path. Or I should say two trips down parallel paths, let's put it that way. Now maybe that didn't help you, but, but I'm saying yes, the disciples did have that view, and they thought Jesus was fulfilling that. They thought the that he initiated the kingdom in his preaching. And you might say the resurrection initiates stage two, if you want to put it that way. I think there was another part about the 
you know, shared hallucination thing. But if you don't mind, since there are a couple other people, I, I'd yeah, like I, to try to get as many as we can. Yeah, I didn't hear that part at all. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me first? So far. Okay. Um, <laughs> See, we, so, we don't hear anything we don't want to hear, so. <laughs> Selective. <laughs> Um, sort of going in the same vein with like video evidence, video is pretty good evidence versus written evidence. Um, it seems like as our ability to provide um, maybe more authentic proof such as video proof might be better than somebody saying, I saw somebody throw a football and it looked like he got a, a touchdown or whatever. Um, it seems to me like there's less and less evidence um, as time advances like the Bible has a whole collection of evidence if somebody accepts that, but um, as, as we've had better means to document it, such as audio, recording, recently, and video, um, there should be, there should be some, some evidence that, that we could say, here's an audio recording or here's a video recording, it's pretty hard to refute this, here's some good evidence, and so do you think it's sort of a coincidence that we haven't seen more evidence since it'd be even easier to record a whole lot of evidence rather than get some special people to write it, such as with the Bible. Sorry, or, this is or, or perhaps really as, confusing, an but. as an alternative, if the resurrection happened now and we caught it yeah. on that'd MTV. Be, that'd be neat. Again, I got those tapes in the back. Well, uh, that'd be neat, but let me, I, this may not be going anywhere what you're saying, but for good or for ill, we're dealing with an ancient historical event. And in ancient history, we can only deal with the tools we have. And so, let, let me give you an example. We, we say today, we use the phrase uh, Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon. And we say that like that's a real sure event. There are two sources in the ancient world for Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon and one takes from the other one. So we've got one. So when you have multiple sources for something, that increases, I, I, yeah. I mean, obviously we don't have a video camera, but what you do have you have to deal with the data you do have, and that's what ancient history is based on. No one's going to throw ancient history out the window, so you, have, you deal with what you have. That's a short. I don't know what that sign means, except it, it that it means, says stop. It, there's a sign that says stop there. So, <laughs> so, uh, we've, we, we, we've been cued that uh, that's uh, the official one.